marketers, do you care about SEO? I'm sure you do. And if so, you definitely need to give a listen to this episode. It's with an SEO expert, Dale Bertrand. Uh, If that name sounds familiar, he is also a very popular speaker on the marketing circuit. I was most recently with him at Content Marketing World. He was also at Inbound and he'll be at the Industrial Marketing Summit in early 2024. And on today's episode, we talk about all the changes that have happened and are due to happen early next year on the front of search engines and large language models. And we also talk about how to use AI to help you in your SEO efforts. Let's do this. Welcome to Content Marketing Engineered, your source for building trust and generating demand with technical content. Here is your host, Wendy Covey. Hi, and welcome to Content Marketing Engineered. On each episode, I'll break down an industry trend, challenge, or best practice in reaching technical audiences. You'll meet colleagues, friends, and clients of mine who will stop by to share their stories. And I hope that you leave each episode feeling inspired and ready to take action. Before we jump in, I'd like to give a brief shout out to my agency, True Marketing. True is a full service agency located in beautiful Austin, Texas, serving highly technical companies. For more information, visit truemarketing.com. And now on with our podcast. Hey, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Content Marketing Engineered. I'm joined today by Dale Bertrand. He's the CEO of Fire and Spark and a hugely popular marketing speaker. And I'm so excited to have you here, Dale. Well, thank you for having me. I'm looking forward to our conversation. I know. I mean, we have two popular subjects on tap here with SEO and AI. So every marketer should be listening to this episode for sure. Um, But before we dive in, I I just want to say it's great to see you again. We were just together in Cleveland at Content Marketing World and had a drink together at one of the many social events. It was just fun catching up with you. And then before that, you were at Inbound in Boston, right? Maybe the week before or something. So Yes, yes. Inbound and Content Marketing World are great conferences. I see so many people that I know, uh, but I've been doing so many conferences this year. I think I need a break over the holidays. I bet. I bet your family wants to spend some time with you. They're like, yeah, who is this guy? <laughs> Well, I want you to know that my team at Inbound voted your session as their very favorite. So you're doing something right. And um, we're so excited to have you be a presenter at our upcoming Industrial Marketing Summit too. So just congratulations on your continued success as a speaker. It's cool. Well, thank you. And thanks for giving me a reason to get down to Austin. That's going to be fun. Yeah, hopefully it'll be warm that week. We'll see. I, mean, I it could go either way in uh, you know late January, early February. So oh, it's going to be warmer than Boston, where I'm <laughs> from. Right? So it'll be good for sure, for sure. Well, one of the reasons we were excited to have you at the summit, despite just your general awesomeness um, and knowledge at SEO and AI, was also that you have both a bachelor's and a master's degree in electrical engineering, which is maybe a little known fact that people seeing you speak, they didn't realize they're they're hearing an engineer. So I'm very curious to hear the backstory on what led you away from engineering and towards marketing. Oh, wow. Okay. So, I mean, for me, I've always loved computers. So uh, when I was in high school, I was programming, you know, building my own PC for gaming, all of that. And that was a while ago. So when I got to college, like I I wanted to study computer engineering, not CS because I convinced myself I already knew how to program. Um, So when I graduated from school, I worked as an electrical engineer on the hardware side and on the software side. I absolutely loved it. Um, I think the thing for me was that I only worked at tech startups. So I did four tech startups in a row that was um, quite draining and I was pretty, oh, yeah, that's a grind. Towards, yeah. Towards the end of it. Um, but it was a wonderful experience. And, you know, at the end of that, it probably it was 10 years of that. I decided I wanted to move over to the marketing side. So I quit my full-time job at my fourth tech startup and decided that I wasn't writing code anymore. I was only going to do marketing. Um, and, and not writing code for me was like amputating my right arm because that's <laughs> why I, that's how I communicated um, yeah. with with the world, really. I mean, that that was my thing. 
But um, it it turned out because of the switch at the time, and this is like 15 years ago, because the marketing world was switching to digital, my skills were in hot demand and just just take it from there. Um, and then also because I, I studied AI in grad school, I've had a lot of people asking me to do SEO. So nowadays I, I run an agency. We only do SEO strategy, just really focused on that. So it, it's worked out pretty well. Yeah. And I see in just my conversations I've had with you of how you've translated that programming knowledge into how you approach marketing and it's unique. And like you said, in demand, I mean, it's, it's working. So, um, so that's a lot of what I want to get in your head today about. And, um, just, man, the world of SEO has shifted so much in the past, what, 18 months, year. So maybe let's start there and just talk about some of the major changes that you've observed. Yeah. Well, I just want to say one of the reasons why I like working on SEO is because it changes so rapidly. So there's always something new to learn, just like when I was doing software. In order to stay in the profession, you know, the whole the whole point is you have to keep up with it. And that's um, funny but, because most marketers are so annoyed by that and you like love it. <laughs> it shows yeah, you yeah. Where you should be. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. Um, but there have been some major changes. Like everybody knows that AI is a thing and Google shift to AI has some major implications on how their search engine works and, and other AI search engines like Bing, how they work. But then also it has some implications on search behavior, like how the customers we're all going after are searching and the tools that we're using to do SEO and content are all shifting at the same time. And keeping up with it is is can definitely be mind boggling yeah. <laughs> and complex. Yeah. So, you know, it used to be the old way, right? We were doing keyword stuffing and we were trying to get backlinks on EDUs and, you know, wherever. And so there was a lot of, I guess, I guess you get to call that technical SEO, but it was really kind of also gaming the system rather than looking at, you know, who is my target audience and how do I meet them where they are with the right content. So I'm curious to hear what type of approach is working and uh, you know, do you still see the gaming side of things even a thing now, or have we moved well beyond that? We've moved well beyond that is the is the answer to that question. But it it used to be that uh, Google was the keyword search engine. And what we're trying to do is build content that's optimized for the right keywords. And when we're doing that, we're really building for the search engine. Mm -hmm. And a lot of marketers didn't realize that Google's changing so rapidly, they're getting better and better at achieving their ultimate goal, which is to help searchers find the answers that they're looking for, find the information they need to make a buying decision. Um, if, you're, if you're a business with a service or a product to sell, that's that's really what you want to be focused on. So, so I think the best way to frame it is that Google used to be a keyword search engine. That's why it made sense for us to follow SEO best practices and put the keywords in the right place. But nowadays, Google is completing its transit. It's not there yet, but it's getting to the point that Google is more of a question answering engine. So anybody that goes to Google and enters something into Google, you can think of that query as a question. They're either trying to um, get some information or find a product or find a business or navigate to a particular website or forum or whatever it is that they're looking for. Yeah. And Google wants to give them that information they're looking for um, rather than just uh, 10 links with some ads on top. Okay, so how do I reconcile then when I look at the data of how an engineer uses Google and uh, they go really deep, right? So we have this annual state of marketing to engineers report and, in, and a technical buyer is more likely to go all the way to page 10 than they are uh, to stop at page one. And I think part of that is there's a lack of trust of that they're so trained that, oh, that's all page, page one. We don't trust page one. And I think part of it too, is they're looking for that, if you will, that long tail, like we used to always talk about, you know, those deep applications and often they don't surface with credible sources right up front. So how do you think this new world might translate to that technical buyer? So we, we, the truth is we don't know at this point. We have to watch how search behavior is gonna change. 
um, by looking at changes in where people are landing on your website, what they're talking into Google. Um, we're expecting that the search queries you see in your search console account are going to get longer as people realize that Google is better at finding answers to the questions. And, I, and I'm going to give you an example. So on my drive home last night, I was um, talking to ChatGPT because because you can use the app on your phone. And I wanted it to solve a problem for me that I hadn't had time to really look into while I was driving, uh, while I was driving, but I didn't have time to look into it during the day. And it was how to use a specific API to do something. But I had a 20 minute conversation with ChatGPT. Like, how does this API work? Which endpoint should I use? What parameters do I need? Does it support this type of filter? Okay, would it support this other type of filter? And that is a search behavior yes, that before, like a couple of days ago, I didn't even know I could do. Yeah. But the idea that I could have a conversation about an API that I haven't even really sat down to write any code for yet, um, you know, with a tool, in this case, ChatGPT, a large language model AI, not a search engine, um, is just mind blowing to me. But what Google's going to look like starting early next year is it's going to be a combination of a large language model and a search engine just kind of mashed together. Yeah. So, so you still get I, a question answer, but also this long form conversational result. Yeah. So then really Google's hedging its bets for informational queries where um, Google thinks it can give me a good answer. It's like, and nobody knows exactly what this is gonna look like, but it's likely to give you an answer at the top of the page, just like featured snippets that we see now, plus a bunch more information farther down the page. Um, for, for product searches, it's doing a lot of like just surfacing the actual product rather than giving you links to product pages on e-commerce sites. But what how it's gonna affect us as marketers really depends on what types of keywords we're going after. And we're all going after many different types of keywords. So it'll affect our, our different types of traffic differently. Right, right. So I remember uh, being exposed over the summer to the concept of fluid searches, like you're using that large language model to have a conversation like you did last night, and then that quick question answer. And that seems like a, a clear case where you'd maybe uh, go towards one source versus the other, one engine rather. Yeah, and we know that like the customers that we're trying to reach are learning how to use this technology, like you know, in real time as we speak. But but search behavior is going to change. You know, it's it's likely that the clicks you do get from a search engine are going to be more qualified because they've already had a, a multi-step conversation with the search engine to narrow down exactly what their needs are, what they're looking for before they've clicked to go to your site. Yeah, fair enough. Uh, we've been a part of that Google SGE pilot, and it's been so interesting. Every couple of weeks, we'll put in this, if you will, a long tail technical term to just see what it surfaces. And it's just been interesting to watch how it's changed. You know, uh, one week it showed more videos, and but the videos that it showed us were different than if you do the search on YouTube. And so, uh, you know, I... I think it's interesting for marketers to just go test some of your applications and different terms that you want to optimize to just see what comes up on these different platforms. Yeah, um, and even that can be misleading because we don't know what a Google search engine experience is going to look like when real consumers start using it, when we see mass adoption. We also don't know if Google is going to push for mass adoption of this interface because at the end of the day, what mm -hmm. it comes down to is whether it threatens their ad model and the revenue that they're making from their advertising. Uh, and that's what they're testing right now <laughs> to see yeah. you know, what enhancements they can offer on their search results pages that either don't affect their ad revenue or, or improve their ad revenue. Is it within the legal boundaries for them to use, let's say if you have a product query, for them to not reveal whether or not there's an ad associated with one of the products that they list? Do you know? I don't know the legalities of it, but they're definitely moving towards, you know, less um, attribution, well, it's not attribution, but they're, yeah. they're definitely moving towards um, not labeling the ads as conspicuously as they have in the past. I mean, that's been a long running trend. Right. 
Interesting. So this technical buyer that, you know, doesn't trust those ads, doesn't trust page one, it would be so interesting to look at that behavior. Uh, we, we had another survey, it was just with European engineers, uh, and it was our first opportunity to ask about AI behavior. And so uh, this was, the survey was done over the summer. And we said, you know, do you use AI for work? And only 15% said yes. So that was the first surprise. And then out of that 15%, that said yes. Uh, the main purpose was search. So we're seeing that adoption. And of course, this was on the heels of privacy concerns. I remember Italy shut down ChatGPT for a while and then brought it back and all of that. So uh, we'll be asking the same with our global audience and, and publishing those results in January. So it'll be interesting to keep a pulse on this one. Yeah. I mean, what's going to happen is we know that the customers we're trying to reach are going to be searching. Like they're going to be searching for information for products. I mean, that's that's going to happen. The tools they use are going to change. Um, so for us as like search marketers, uh, they, we're going to be thinking about search more broadly. So there'll be like LLM SEO, and then there'll be like Google search box SEO, and then there's YouTube SEO. And so it's just, it's just going to be broader in terms of the number of channels that we're going to want to optimize for. Okay, so let's talk about optimization of large language models. I heard from what I heard, it's you have to be everywhere and it's more number of mentions rather than quality. Is that your assessment? It's kind of a sad assessment. <laughs> yeah, but I, so yes, but I, I want to be careful because nobody really knows where this is headed. Fair. Because um, what matters a lot is how the information that, um, searchers, you know, surface through a large language model like Bard or like ChatGPT. Um, what matters is how it's attributed. Mm -hmm. So is it going to be attributed with a link that might send them back to my website because I'm the one that um, that wrote the original content? I, I think there's a, an argument to be made that one direction the large language models will go over the next several years is to dif differentiate between like accurate information and um, inaccurate by by really looking at who online has the expertise to write about different topics. Mm -hmm. That that's what Google's doing. And another way that that will happen is um, really what Google's doing now with with um, the search generative experience, which is that they're combining the output of a large language model with the uh, results that would be typically returned by their search engine and then using that to figure out so that you get the answer from the large language model, but you get the attribution from the search engine. Um, uh. but, but what's important there is that Google search engine is trying to identify which websites it trusts, which authors it trusts, what information does it trust so they can give you more accurate information. And the first generations of these large language models were really just looking at everything that's ever been written on the web and averaging it all together. When we all know that Google already has the technology to do better than that, to identify the most trustworthy sources of information. So, so I think that really leads into, um, you know, the advice that I'm giving my clients and how to prepare, which is that uh, most of the businesses that I work with are expertise driven. So they have subject matter experts in house. Um, trusted subject matter experts, sometimes with decades of experience in their field. And so what I really want my clients to start doing is thinking about how they solidify their position as a trusted expert in Google's eyes, because that will pay dividends going forward, re regardless of what shape these search, in, these search interfaces take or how search behavior changes. Makes sense. And um, the large language models perhaps will follow. It makes sense that they would. But then just fundamentally, someone visiting your site, you know, if they feel from everything they've read that you're trusted resources, obviously they're going to be more likely to want to purchase from you. So seems like a no brainer. Um, how, what are some first steps to build a spokesperson or, uh, you know, somebody you've identified as a subject matter expert to build them into a trusted resource that Google can recognize digital to digital. Ah, I can't talk. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah. So there's, there's two sides of this, two sides of the same coin. You want to think about both at the same time. One side of it is what assets do you have? What resources do you already have? 
Um, yeah. I'm sure the companies that I work with have subject matter experts internally. Some of them love to write white papers and articles. Some of them love to do a podcast or video. Some of them love to speak on stage or talk to people in person and do networking events. But you got to kind of start where you're at, like use the resources that you have um, and then figure out how to leverage that for the signals that Google's looking for which is the other side of the coin, which is making sure that you've got information on your website that is comprehensive, narrowly focused on your, your area of subject matter expertise, and you're getting engagement with that content. So uh -huh. one of the big signals that proves to Google that the content is useful to your audience is that people click on your results, which is engagement on the search results page, and they go to your website and they stay there. They don't bounce off your, mm -hmm. your site. That's super important. So back to the fundamentals of just mm -hmm. looking at web behavior on your site through GA4 or your, your selected platform to do so. But GA4 is definitely showing you what Google's using, right? So, yeah, and leaning yeah, into those areas of expertise. So, yeah. just a quick example I work with a number of engineering consulting firms that might do consulting around water filtration or product design or something like that. Um, many of them have the same problem, which is that they do so many different things from like prototyping to design to design for manufacturing that when you look at how Google is treating their website, there are specific areas within their areas of expertise that Google is showing their content for. And then there are other areas where Google is not. And when you look at that, and you can see that type of information by looking at search console data for your website. But when you look at that, it's really giving you a map of the specific areas within your expertise that Google trusts you on and the ones that, where Google doesn't. And what you would love is to take a look at that and uh, lean into the areas where Google already trusts you, mm -hmm. um, because that aligns with your the services that you're that you offer and um, you know the content that you're creating. Then you're golden. Sometimes it doesn't really align because Google doesn't trust you for whatever reason in the areas that you would like. But then that's a different problem. You need to build up that trust and authority in those areas. But but the reason why I bring up these engineering consulting um, websites is because they're usually just too broad, mm -hmm. and what you love is like industrial water filtration consultancy. Like we will come out, test the water, give you some recommendations, and then just have that be super narrow. You guys, your brand is the expert in this space. Your website is broadly covering in a very comprehensive manner, all of the questions that Google knows your customers are asking um, about, and Google knows more than, than we do about the questions your customers are asking and the information your customers need. Uh, to make their buying decision. But if you can figure out what all that stuff is, usually the best way is to actually talk to your customers, figure out their needs and write down all the questions they ask you. Um, but if you can broadly cover that that niche topic, then that's really the first step in Google seeing your brand as the authority and the experts in that space. Isn't it an amazing how it's just full circle back to basic marketing principles, you know, own a niche, build expertise, have a library of content that's very deep on that subject, have a subject matter expert. These, these are things that everybody should be doing anyway. Um, to, for a while, pillar pages were a very important way to show this expertise to the world on your website. Is that still an important tool? I mean, it still works like within your area of expertise. Like if you're building out pillar pages, um, you know, just the fact that you're trying to make your pillar pages comprehensive is going to help you in that regard. And then you're also likely to get featured snippets. They're also likely to be um, the the fuel that <laughs> fuels these large language models when they're, they're slurping them up. And then also I would assume if you're building out these pillar pages, they're linking to sub pages on related topics that are also helping you to, to cover this topic space in a comprehensive fashion. Okay. Um, so it really has more to do with the, like what I would focus on is the, the, your engagement with the pillar pages. So as uh -huh. long as the bounce rate is reasonable. Um, right. Having the existence of the page isn't enough. Actually driving people to it and having them like the page and stay and click in is, you know, obviously. Yeah, and not bounce off it because, you know, that proves to Google that it's actually helpful and useful. 
yeah. to your target audience. Makes sense. Okay, well, uh, let's shift gears a little bit and talk about AI because it, we, we've already talked about large language models and their impact on search and what the future might be. But I have a sneaking suspicion knowing you and some of the conversations we've had, you I know you've been experimenting with AI quite extensively, both personally and professionally. And so I imagine your team are probably using it for SEO and for other things too. So just give me some cool examples of what you guys are doing these days with AI. Yeah, I mean, on the AI side, I studied AI in grad school. So I've been following it and, um, you know, in the last couple of years, as large language models have gotten more useful, we've been just trying to use them for everything. And, you know, I can say that they're both super useful and overhyped at the same time. Um, you know, a lot of the things we tried didn't work, but we did find a number that have been just, just amazing, like just amazingly productive in terms of SEO tasks and content generation tasks, and then just automation. So yeah. we're doing everything from generating sales follow-up emails to generating outreach emails for conferences that I want to speak at. And these are emails that get just automatically put into my drafts folder and I can review them and then send them. Um, I'm doing things like recording my sales calls and webinars and you know podcasts and video recordings like this. And then I have 20 prompts that will extract various types of content from all the words that come out of my mouth on, <laughs> you know, for events and sales calls. Um, but then there's also like the SEO work, like generating the first draft of metadata and title tags, mm. generating um, outlines. Um, there's one tool that I've been using a lot where you give it a keyword, it will automatically fetch the top 10 results from Google and it will fetch all the pages that appear in the top 10 results and then give you a summary in the form of an outline of all the information Google's showing for that keyword. And the reason why I love that is because that's telling me what Google thinks the intent is behind the keyword. Aha, uh -huh. makes what sense. What Google thinks people are looking for. Yeah. And if I'm, if, and just back to the water filtration in the example, if, if I, if I, um, if my CEO, let's say, told me that, hey, we want to rank number one for water filtration, I would type water filtration into this particular tool. We would see, well, wait a minute. It's actually a consumer keyword. Oh, <laughs> People yeah, sure. For a water filter, not an industrial water filter, but it's the type of tool. It's an AI-based tool because you need AI to understand what's on those pages and interpret the search intent and give you like a really nice bulleted list. Yeah. But that's that's another another tool that I'm enjoying. So there's just a lot of little tools. I mean, my team is building um, a number of tools and trying a number of different, you know, AI enabled software packages and some of it works, some of it doesn't, but I feel like we need to put the time into experimenting because when we find something, it, it can be huge. Yeah. It can be a big competitive advantage. It can help you with your bottom line. I mean, so many <laughs> benefits. Um, are there any specific tools, like forget mainstream LLMs, right? We all kind of know what's out there, but um, any particular tools that you're excited about that you think marketers should take a look at? Yeah, I'll give I'll give some tools, but one thing that I'll say is for a lot of marketers, the way you're going to benefit from AI tools is that there are going to be new AI features that pop up in the tools you're already using. Mm -hmm. Like you already have a WordPress website or a HubSpot um, CRM or everything else that that marketers use. They're all going to be, and they've already started incorporating AI features into those tools. So that's really the way most marketers are going to be using these tools. But I happen to like a, a tool called Cast Magic, which takes audio files and runs your prompts against them. And 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 I'll and my audio files will be like a, a sales call or a webinar or something. So I use that tool a lot. And then we've just started creating custom GPTs. Like you can give it uh, documents that you've written. Like maybe you've written, or actually, um, I wrote a a pretty comprehensive guide on. Um, marketing positioning for um, for service bureaus, the manufacturing service bureaus, and you know wrote that several years ago. But you can give a comprehensive document like that to a custom GPT, and now all of a sudden it is an expert in that space based yeah. on the information they gave it. And you could ask it to do things. You can ask it to do calculations. You can ask it to write code. You can ask it to um, 
to help you analyze spreadsheets or any other form of tabular data, which is absolutely amazing. Um, but actually, now that I've just talked myself into that direction, the answer I would give you is like, I have a ChatGPT Plus account. Inside ChatGPT Plus, there's um, advanced data analytics. You can give it a spreadsheet, like maybe an analytics spreadsheet that you've exported from Search Console or Google Analytics, and you can ask it, how can you help me analyze this data? Or what's interesting to you in this data? Or ask it for something specific, like why did we lose traffic last week? Or something like that. Yeah. And that's just absolutely amazing. That's a game changer. We've been experimenting with that with our annual research study. Okay, here, let's load all the raw data and then have it tell us, what are some observations you have about, you know, younger engineers and their behavior when looking yeah, at- Yeah, and, and what people don't realize about that particular tool is that when I describe it to people, they're like, oh yeah, that sounds cool, but I don't want to invest in learning it. And what people don't realize is that it teaches you, like you really just give it the spreadsheet and you say, hey, how can you help me? And it'll walk you through it. It'll tell you about like numerical quantitative analyses that you didn't know and explain why it might do this one rather than this one. And then you say, okay, we'll try the first one. And then it tries and say, well, that one didn't work so well. So let's try that second one I told you about. And that blows my mind. Like that's just absolutely amazing. So I'm learning while I'm using it. I'm learning how it can help me. And um, it's cutting the time dramatically that it takes to analyze data. So for marketers that, either feel behind. I mean, look, we all feel behind because it's, it's for you, Dale, I'm sure, but since things are changing so rapidly, but if they're kind of late to the game, they haven't done much with AI. It, it sounded like one piece of advice you've already said was start with the new functionality in your existing tools. So if HubSpot or Canva or whatever it is, they all have some cool new features. So I think that was great advice. Any other um, advice for those marketers? Yeah, what I would say is like a lot of people are really leaning towards using AI tools to create content. And I just wouldn't start there. Um, first of all, it's no good at creating content from scratch. Um, you're gonna get frustrated. But what I would do is use it to for ideas and how to update content you already have. Yeah. Uh, and then hire a real human writer to do the actual updates. But um, you could look, you could give it content that's already doing well, maybe a page on your website that's already doing well, ask it to compare the themes and concepts in that piece of content compared to the piece of content that's ranking number one for the keyword that you care about. Mm -hmm. And it'll give you a number of ideas. Some of them will be good, some of them won't, but then work with your human writer. Yeah, a little bit of both. Very yeah. good. Well, for those, since again, this engineering background of yours is, is just, it's part of who you are. So you get our challenge of marketing to the skeptical, highly technical buyer. So what tips do you have for marketers trying to reach those folks? Give them options. Cause I mean, I worked as an engineer and I didn't trust any answer. So if I ask you a question you say, and you tell me the answer is five, I'm going to be like, oh, that wasn't useful. But I, <laughs> so in any, and, and that's why it makes a lot of sense that um, I would expect search behavior in that space to change differently than it will for consumers who are, let's say, more lazy when it comes to just click looking, they're just online looking for a buy button. Um, so give them options in terms of techniques or, or answers, explain under what circumstances each answer is applicable and, and just really go down that, that rabbit hole with them. Think of it as geeking out with a fellow engineer when you're writing the content rather than just giving them the answer. And that is what is going to elicit trust from an engineer. Oh, I like that. Geek out with your engineer. It's great. <laughs> uh, well, Dale, you this has been a wonderful half hour with you. I've learned so much and you've given a lot of helpful advice to marketers. Where can people go to connect with you and learn more about Fire and Spark? Well, I mean, if you have any questions, connect with me directly, you know, dale at fireandspark.com. Our website is fireandspark.com, all spelled out. And, and connect with me on LinkedIn. I'm Dale Bertrand on LinkedIn. Um, so, because I post there a bunch of, on these topics. Yeah. And then you'll be speaking in Austin on February 1st at the Industrial Marketing Summit. So that's another opportunity for people to get more of Dale. Uh, you can learn more about that event at the industrialmarketingsummit.com. Well, thank you so much for your time today, Dale. Awesome, awesome. And I'll see you in person in Austin. Sounds great. Thanks for joining me today on Content Marketing Engineered. For show notes, including links to resources, visit truemarketing.com slash podcast. 
While there, you can subscribe to our blog and our newsletter and order a copy of my book, Content Marketing Engineer. Also, I would love your reviews on this podcast. So please, when you get a chance, subscribe and leave me your review on your favorite podcast subscription platform. Thanks and have a great day.